God, the Lord, created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. He gives breath to everyone. Life to everyone who walks the earth. Jesus. And it is he who says, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you. I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. You will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. to him.
Praise Jesus. Amen. Well, how many are excited to be in church today? Yes, we are. And how many are excited to have the first snow of the year? Yeah. Wah, wah, wah. Hey, God is still good all the time. It's all right. Spring is here. Spring is coming. Let's just continue to praise Jesus and give him honor and glory for all he does, for his faithfulness in our life. Lift our songs to you today, Jesus. Behold the Father's heart, the mystery he lavishes on us. As deep cries out to deep, oh, how desperately he wants us. Things of earth stand next to him like a candle to the sun. Unfailing Father, what compares to his great love? Behold his holy son. The lion and the lamb get into us. The word became a man that my soul should know its savior. Forsaken for the sake of all mankind, salvation is in his blood. Messiah, the righteous die for love. But he wasn't over, he is the risen one. Oh,
Come on. Sing it one more time. Then sings, then sings my soul. Then sings my soul. I'll praise your love. I'll praise your love. Oh, then sings my. Working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I Sing that verse. I count on one thing. I count on one thing. The same God never fails. He will not fail me now. You won't fail me now. And in the waiting, the same God who's never late is working all things out. He's working all things out.
Hey, we bow our heads and just thank God for this morning. Lift up your prayers to him. Whatever you've got in your heart this morning, don't hold on to it. And don't hold back. Give it to the Lord. Jesus, we pray to you because you are the most high. You're the lover of our heart. You're the creator of all things, Lord. And you deserve praise. You also say in your word, Lord, that you don't want just a spectacle, an empty celebration. Lord, you want our heart, each one of us. And so, Lord, we offer that to you today. I pray that you, the loving Holy Spirit, would reach in and grab a hold of those of us that have a hard heart today. Whatever is holding us back, Lord, would you soften our hearts? You're the one that does that. And I thank you for that, Jesus. Thank you for always being with us. As we were just singing, no matter what we go through, Lord, you're with us. And knowing that you are with us gives us the hope, the security, and the peace. And we praise you, Lord.
your breath. Praise and glory today. 
love you, Jesus. We praise you above all things, Lord. Amen. You guys can be seated. Homegrown alligator, see you later. Gotta hit the road. Gotta hit the road. The sun ain't changed in the atmosphere. Architecture unfamiliar. I could get used to this. Time flies by in the yellow and green. Stick around and you'll see what I mean. There's a mountain top. That I'm dreaming of If you need me, you know where I'll be I'll be riding shotgun Underneath the hot sun Feeling like a someone I'll be riding shotgun Underneath the hot sun Feeling like a someone We're South of the equator Navigator Gotta hit the road Gotta hit the road A deep sea diving round the clock Bikini bottoms, lager tops I could get used to this Time flies by in the yellow and green Stick around and you'll see what I mean There's a mountain top that I'm dreaming of If you need me, you know where I'll be Doesn't that music sound like fun? Yes, it reminds us of our Caribbean neighbors who are enjoying very similar weather today. Um, they probably got an inch of new snow. You know this is fourth winter, right? This is fourth winter. We, we, had, um, we had first winter, then we had first spring, then second winter, then now we're on to fourth winter. But listen, our Easter egg hunt is coming up, and at this point, we only have 10 eggs. And our goal is 30,000 candy-filled Easter eggs. So here's what I plan to do. If you do not bring in candy-filled eggs that are taped soon, I will give those children on that Saturday your home address, and they will come to your house, okay? 30,000 candy-filled Easter eggs is our goal. Every year we seem to exceed it. We get nearly 40,000, but just want to remind you the importance of it. That's on Saturday at 11 a.m., and on Friday, the day before, is Good Friday, a service right here at noon. Uh, it's a reflective service. We take communion together, and we'll worship, and we'll reflect on what happened on that Friday. And then Easter Sunday, 7 a.m., 9 a.m., and 11 a.m. Now, let me explain this to you. If you are very religious, you want to come to 7 a.m., okay? That proves to Jesus you're trying to beat him out of the tomb, okay? That's what 7 a.m. is for. And that is the least populated service. If you're looking to avoid the crowds, come to 7 a.m. 9 a.m. is a great service to come to, but think about it. Everybody's coming to this 9 a.m. service because they got to be to Big Rapids Grandma's house by noon. So that's going to be full. If you plan to come to 9 a.m., get here early. But you can come to 11 a.m. because you didn't care enough to get up early enough because it's Resurrection Day. You can show up at 11 a.m. And you know those people. You don't want to mix with them, right? You don't want to go to the 11 a.m. So, But I promise you, it'll be an amazing weekend. It'll be a weekend when we'll know the story and we'll be able to tell others about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, about the fact that he cared enough for us that he died on the cross for our sins. It'll be a, a great celebration weekend. So invite your friends, invite your family. Make sure you get here early and grab a seat, but it will be something that you will hear about. If you miss our Easter Sunday services or Good Friday or that Easter egg hunt, you will hear about it. It will be that amazing. So let's pray, ask God to bless his word, and then I'll jump into it today. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is anointed. It is, it is the very word of God. It is the word that we desperately need to hear. So speak today, Lord, for your servants are listening. God, we desire to draw close to you. I thank you for how dynamic your word can be to us, how it exposes areas of our life, weaknesses, and yet it shows the strength of you. So God, we, we need your Holy Spirit to be the teacher of the hour. We pray peace in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. Let's give praise to God one more time. He is a good God. If you have your Bibles, in Luke chapter 8 is the story that I'm going to be looking at today. And, and you need to understand it's a familiar story. Some of you have heard this before. And, and what happens when you hear a familiar story is you assume, well, I know where this is going. And I don't believe you do today. So stay with me. And Luke chapter 8, verse 43, the story picks up. It said, a, a woman was there 
And I want to stop right there on those first few words when, when, when Luke records, a woman was there. Where is this woman? She has found herself going to the village center. It is where all the commerce and all the people have gathered together. And when she arrives uh, at this place, she is already in the midst of a, a bigger story. You need to understand our story today is just a small part of a story uh, of a larger one. It's already happening. Jesus, when she arrives, is on a mission. He has already gotten information that a little girl is dying. Dying. Jesus is leaving the town square and he is on his way to the house of a very well-known man named J. Iris. As, as, as the woman arrives, Jesus has a critical situation taking place. You understand? You don't want to interrupt this. I mean, I mean, a little girl is dying. And this woman arrives. It says that she had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. I want you to understand something about this woman when it says she is subject to it. It means that it has authority over her. When you are a subject, something is your master. And right now, it is the issue of bleeding. She is bleeding out. It, she has been subjected to bleeding. That means she didn't ask for that. When you are subjected to something, it means she didn't sign up for this. She, she wouldn't wish this upon her own worst enemy. And she's been subjected to it. And, 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 and Luke is clear to say it's lasted 12 years. May I remind you, culturally, in this day and age, if something lasted for 12 years, that could be anywhere from one quarter to one half of someone's lifespan. It, when it says it's been 12 years and it defines that she is a woman, it means that there was a period of time in her life when she did not bleed like this. It's been 12 years that this woman has struggled with this bleeding disorder. And I want you to understand it's a persistent problem. It has not gone away. And, and if you think for a moment that she has only allowed it to happen, look at the last line of verse 43. It says that, that no one could heal her. That means that she's been to the doctor. She's been to the specialist. She's done all the therapy and nothing has changed her condition. 12 years she has been subject to bleeding. It, it implies to me that, that at first I believe this woman had some resources. At first, she had some resources to, to draw upon to deal with her situation. I promise you that first morning when she woke up and she found bled, blood on her bed sheets, she called her mama and she went and gathered her sisters together and she said, have you ever been through anything like this before? When mom didn't have an answer, she called her friends and privately shared with them what was going on in her own body and what was happening to her. She, she had some resources in the beginning, don't we all? When, when something begins to fall apart, we got resources in the beginning. She had family and she had friends. And I bet you any money she had a husband. She had a man by her side and her husband did his best to have compassion for her. She had some money. She had some things that she could fight this with at first. But then I believe after 12 years, on this day, when she arrives at the center of the village, on this day, 12 years in, she's got nothing left. You understand, according to Mosaic law, her husband could divorce her without any harm. You understand that this issue of blood is on par with those who have leprosy. If you've got leprosy, you are banished from your family. You are pushed to the sidelines. You are to touch no one. You are to not go into public. And you are to stay away from other people. By this time, when, when we see this woman in verse 43, her life has already been drained out of her. You understand she is bleeding to death. This woman is dying that we read about in verse 43. Please do not dismiss that from your mind. Don't allow yourself to listen to the story and think, oh, this is a cute little story. This woman that we read about is dying when she arrives. Jesus is moving in that direction. The little girl, he's on a mission. His, his disciples are pushing him. His pace quickens. And, and verse 44 says this, that, that she came up behind Jesus isn't that an interesting line? She came up behind Jesus. It means that she was running behind. It means that she was late to the party. She, was, she came up behind Jesus. And I wonder how many of us feel the same way in our lives. I wonder if you feel like you're behind it today. You're behind the eight ball. You're, you're not making the same uh, distance as other people. When, when she arrives at the center of the village, Jesus is heading in that direction and she is barely making it at this point. I believe, and some scholars have, have, have proposed, that, that when she left the house that morning, she mustered the strength that she had to get to the center square. She was walking when she left the house. She may have even tried to trot a little bit, but with having this issue of blood, she would have very little energy. But by the time she gets to the village square, coming up from behind, she's on her hands and her knees. 
And Luke says in verse 44 that she touched the edge of the cloak and immediately the bleeding stopped. I want you to understand something. In the original Greek, the word immediately literally means immediately. This happened right now. There was, there was no delay in it. Her healing, 12 years of tyranny is over. 12 years of struggle ends in a blink of an eye. Her life is completely turned around. The bleeding stops just because she touches the edge of his cloak. Now, I want to say something to you. Whenever you study God's word, you want to make sure you do counter-references. You want to make sure you, you do some background checks. And you know what I discovered? That Luke is not the only one to record the story. Luke is not the only one to write this down. Mark actually writes it down also. And I want to go to Mark just for a moment. I don't want to confuse you, but I, I want to look at Mark's story, Mark's version, because Mark gives us something that, that Luke didn't give us. Look in Mark chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. Mark says just about the same thing. He said, uh, when the woman heard about Jesus, uh, she came up behind him. Very similar to what Luke said, right? She came up behind him. And then, and then he says this, because she thought, I want you to understand something. Your mind is a powerful weapon. You ought to use it more often. Because she thought, if I just touch the hem of of his garment, I will be healed. She thought to herself, if I can just get there, if I can just reach out far enough, if I can just touch the, the hem of his garment. Now I want you to understand something. Some of us have been so close to this story, we think we know everything about it. But I want to say something to you, those of you who think you've heard it all, let me say this to you, this makes no sense to me. When I first read it, when I read it objectively and I, and I stand back from it, come on, where in the world did she get an idea like this? Where in the world would this woman think, hey, I know what I will do. When I finally arrive at Jesus, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. That makes no sense. Let's be honest. Think about the edge and the hem of his garment. It would have been dirty, okay? It would have been dirty. You understand that this outer garment he's wearing, this cloak that Luke refers to, would have covered him from head to toe. It would have been a, a long uh, coat that, she, that Jesus would have worn. And it would have been made of linen. It, it would have been down to his heels. And, and going over the rough terrain, the rocky and, and dusty terrain of, of Jerusalem in the Middle East, the, the linen would have began to fray at the bottom of his cloak. It would have frayed. There would have been strings and strands of threads hanging there. And, and Jesus, like most, would have stopped. He would have stopped one day, take his cloak off, and then take a few of those strands, maybe a dozen or so, uh, threads hanging off the linen, and, and making sure the rest of the cloak was not destroyed, he would have tied a knot into those threads, making sure that they didn't fray, fray anymore. And he would have done that all the way along the edge of the bottom of his cloak. So on this day, when this woman arrives, and, 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 and she is now probably on her hands and knees, exhausted from the trip, drained and depleted, when she arrives there, what she sees is from behind the cloak of Jesus. This light linen coat, this overcoat, I believe, as Jesus was now rushing to the little girl who was dying, as the breeze caught that cloak, it would have fluttered at the bottom, much like a cape. It would have fluttered a little bit, and in all those tied together little fabric pieces, strings would have looked like tassels hanging from the bottom of his cloak, and to some even, it would look like the, the feathers of a bird's wing. As Jesus was rushing off and the woman on her hands and knees is trying to get there, she would, have, she would have reached out and touched that hem, that edge of his cloak. So remember when I told you this makes no sense to me? What in the world is this woman thinking? Where did she get her information from? Why would she believe if she touched the edge of his cloak, the hem of his garment, she would be healed? Where does she get this from? She gets it from one place. I believe that this woman had a scripture for her struggle. I believe this woman had a scripture to get through her struggle. Follow me very carefully. I believe she knew some things about the Messiah. Listen, she is very well versed as a Jewish child. As a Hebrew woman, she would have gone to the synagogue. She, she would have been in the court of women. She would have heard teachers of the law. She would have known what the Bible says about the Messiah. She would have been familiar not only with the major prophets, 
but the minor prophets as a Hebrew child. As a matter of fact, it is not unusual in Scripture to find those who are living in the New Testament referring to the words of the Old Testament. Matter of fact, Jesus in Luke chapter 4, his first sermon he ever gave in the temple, he quoted from Isaiah 61. He said, I am here to proclaim the good news of the Lord, for the, for the, for the blind will see, the deaf will hear, and Jesus said, and the oppressed shall be set free. Jesus quoted Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4 five in the temple so for me to say that this woman had a scripture for her struggle it is truth why did she touch the hem of his garment because she knew what malachi said she knew what Malachi said. She knew that Malachi said that the son of righteousness will come. There is coming a Messiah, the son of righteousness, and there will be healing in his wings. This woman knew when she got to Jesus, she had been hanging on, I believe, to this scripture to get her through her struggle. For the last 12 years, every time she woke up and her body hurt and her mind ached and she did not rest like everybody else did the night before, I believe she was hanging on to this scripture because this was what was going to get her through her struggle. Listen, my friends, you need a scripture for your struggle. If you are struggling today, you better have the word of God. The scriptures are the word of God. And if God said it, then God is good enough to complete it. You need to have the word of God with you everywhere you go you want to know why I believe this because I got scriptures for my struggle my beautiful little lady Michelle nine years ago the day that she was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor that night in the hospital all alone as I went home there by herself in that in that in, in that in that opera in the in the uh, hospital room with the lights turned off Michelle began to pray after all the CAT scans and the MRIs, and the Lord gave her a scripture that night. Not a new scripture. Not a scripture she was unaware of. It was a scripture she had heard before. And when the Lord gave it to her that night, she contacted me immediately and she said, everything is going to be all right. And I said, what are you talking about, honey? She said, listen, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says this. Speaking about Paul when he had the thorn in his flesh and God wouldn't take it away. She goes, this is my scripture my grace is sufficient for you, says Jesus, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And I want to tell you something. That got her through a lot of dark and difficult moments. And over the last nine years, we've had some hurdles. We've had some hiccups. But what does she do? She goes back to the scripture that God gave her to get her through her struggle. I'm telling you right now, you better have a scripture for your struggle. And if you don't, pray. Ask God to give you a scripture. If he doesn't speak to you, then do your own homework. Google scriptures on healing. Google scriptures on hurting. Google scriptures on marriage and difficulties and loss. Find your own scripture. You need a scripture to get through your struggle. As I'm telling you right now, if you're hanging by a thread, it ought to be from the hem of his garment in Jesus' name. I am preaching way too hard to a dissident crowd here, I think. It's interesting. The story goes on. It says this. Jesus calls out in verse 45. He said, who touched me, right? It says, though Jesus has been awakened, even though he was fully alert, he says, who touched me? And his disciples go, Lord, what are you talking about, man? Everybody's touching you. We've bumped into you. There's a crowd of people pressing you. Why in the world would you ask such a silly question as, who touched me? See, Jesus knew power had gone out from him. He knew power had left him. And, and he asked, who touched me? Now, I just, I want to say something. And I want to make sure I'm very careful here because I'm not saying that Luke got it wrong and I'm not saying that Jesus um, asked the wrong question. So I want to move quick in case lightning came. You, uh, you need to understand, okay? But, but when Jesus said, who, who touched me, I want you to understand something. That doesn't make sense to me because as far as I can tell when I read my Bible, this woman did not touch him. The woman did not touch his hand. The woman did not touch his arm. She did not touch his head, his back, or even his feet. My Bible says that she did not touch Jesus, but she touched what was touching him. She touched the hem of his garment. And what I love about that is it tells me that there is so much power accessible in Jesus Christ that we don't even realize. You listen, understand, this woman, when she came to Jesus that day, when she came up from behind, when she got there, she, she thought to herself, I know the agenda. I've heard about the little girl. Jesus, you keep moving that direction. I'll do what I got to do from here. I don't need your time. I don't need your attention. We don't need to introduce ourselves. We don't need to make eye contact. I'm going to be here just for a second. I don't need 
much. I just need one touch of the hem of your garment and I will be out of your hair, Jesus, and we'll never speak of this again. Listen, this woman understood that if she just touched the hem of his garment, what was touching him, she could be healed. Listen, my wife said this to me a, a few months ago. She said to me, she said, I think the saddest thing will be that when we get to the end of our lives and we look back over it and we begin to realize all that was available to us through Jesus Christ that we did not access and we'll be brokenhearted because most of us access so little of Jesus and there is so much of him available to you and I. We access so little. We treat him like a genie in the bottle when we need a prayer request answered. We treat him like a, like, like, like a little trick that we have up our sleeve. And listen, there is so much available to us. There was power in what was touching him. She didn't touch him. She touched what was touching him. And I hope that there is faith in us today to reach out and touch what is touching him because power is available to you and I. My Bible says this, verse 47, I'm almost done. It says that, uh, that the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, now this is the title of my message, she saw that she could not go unnoticed. It simply means this, that, that when she, she looked at her life, she realized, I'm healed, I'm whole, and Jesus is asking too many questions. I want you to know that Jesus will ask a lot of questions of us. The interesting thing is he's already got the answer before he asks. He's a better daddy than we ever had. He, he asked a question. She knows he's asking around, who touched me? He ain't leaving the square. He's not going to get the little girl. This woman now, overwhelmed by this, he, 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 she stops and she sees that she cannot go unnoticed. You understand, she has spent the better part of her life trying to go unnoticed, right? Because of the bleeding disorder, because it is on par with leprosy, she has pulled away from humanity. She has hidden in the shadows. She has, she has lived her life in the dark, but now she can't go unnoticed. The Bible says this. This is interesting. It says she came to him trembling. She came to him trembling, and then, and then she, she fell at his feet. You understand, when I read that, th this woman probably is assuming that for the first time in 12 years, something has gone right in my life. I am healed. And now she believes there's something wrong. Because she comes to Jesus trembling. She believes that she's, she's done something wrong. And, and, and now how could something so good be so bad? How could something that was so right be so wrong? She comes to him trembling. And my Bible says that she, that she fell at his feet. She's, she's back down on her knees in the presence of Jesus. And when I read that line, I couldn't help but think of you and I today, my friends. Do you understand that this woman, 12 years earlier, before the bleeding ever started, she was standing upright. On the day the bleeding began, she fell to the ground. She has had moments where she's been up, and she's had moments when she was down. When she left her house this morning, I believe she was standing tall. But by the time she got to the center of the town, she was back down on, the, on her hands and knees. And then when she gets healed, when immediately the bleeding stops, she's back up onto her feet, praising the Lord. But now, now in verse 47, she's back down on her knees up and then she's down up and then she's down up and then she's down I can't help but, but imagine it looked like she was, she was doing the hurdles up and down up and down and the Lord showed me this that our healing will often come with some hurdles my friends understand this our healing will often come with some hurdles. Some days you're going to be up and some days you're going to be down. You don't believe me? Ask a couple who's fighting to restore their marriage today, who's fighting to, to deal with the issues that caused the falling out, the affair or whatever it might be. There are some days when you are up, I promise you, mama, aren't there? And daddy, there are some days that you are down, but you got to keep fighting. You got to keep pushing forward. I promise you there's somebody here today who's been diagnosed with cancer. If you got cancer today, you understand what I'm talking about. Your healing will come with some hurdles. There are days when you are up and then there are days when you are down if you've got an addiction issue and you're trying to kick it in Jesus name I promise you you know that you there are hurdles to your healing some days you're up and some days you're down this woman is down down on her knees in the presence of Jesus and then Jesus finally speaks to her last verse I'll share he finally speaks to her and he says to her one word he says daughter now, I want you to understand something. When, when, when he says, daughter, there could not have been a more powerful word 
that Jesus could have used in this moment than that one word. He calls her daughter. Do you know why that is so powerful? Do you know why that one word means so much to her? Because for 12 years, this woman, because her bleeding issue was on par with leprosy, her family, her mom and her dad, disowned her. She wasn't welcome at their house anymore, and they didn't come to see her anymore. She was abandoned by mama and daddy. And so when Jesus said, daughter, he was letting her know, I'm reinstating you. You got an earthly mother and father, but I will be your father today. You are my daughter. When Jesus said daughter, he was reminding her of what my Bible says. My Bible says that we are heirs of his salvation. That means we are sons and daughters of righteousness, my friends. My Bible says that Jesus will be the father to the fatherless. You've ever been abandoned. If you've ever been dismissed by family, I want you to understand something. No matter what you have done, you will always be his daughter, and you will always be his son, no matter what. He called her daughter, and then, and then he says a second thing. He says, he says your faith, your faith has healed you. I, you got to get this in your spirits, my friends. If you're struggling today, what does Jesus say? He says to the woman, your faith, your faith has healed you, not my faith. Not, a, not the Savior's faith. Your faith has healed you. Not the faith of your mama and your daddy. Your faith has healed you. Listen, you better have a faith if you're facing a struggle. You better have faith in a God that is bigger than your problem. You better have faith in the scripture that is getting you through your struggle. You better have your own faith, your faith. He said, your persistent pursuit of me, your passionate desire not to give it up, your faith in believing that there was power in the hem of my garment, enough for you, healing in my wings. It's your faith, girl, that has healed you. What do you need today? What do you need today? Do you need more faith? You can't get it from anyone else. It is not contagious. It is not something that is passed down through bloodlines. It cannot be transmitted to you from me. You've got to have your own faith. And the way you get that is knowing more about Jesus, knowing more of his word and spending more time with him. And then Jesus says the last thing to her, just three words, but they may be the most profound words that he speaks to her. He says, go in peace. You understand, for 12 years, this woman has lived in chaos. For 12 years, this woman has had sleepless nights and mornings where she was too tired to do her task. He said, go in peace. He provided for her a peace that passed all understanding. He said to her, I'm giving you something that you cannot give yourself. He said, go in peace. Earlier in the book of Luke, Jesus stood in the boat as the wind and the waves crashed over the boat and the disciples were scared to death, Jesus stood up and he said, Peace, be still. And the wind and the waves became completely calm. That's what he offered to her. He offered peace. I think peace is one of those things that we so often move through life without. Some of you today are in chaos. Some of you today, your mind is spinning out of control. For some of you, you can't have a collective thought because you are allowing your struggle and your problem and what is killing you to keep you from what only he can provide for you, and that is his peace. May you hear the words of Jesus today when he says, peace, be still over your storm. And may it become completely calm. See, this woman, she's set free now, right? She's set free. Jesus now releases her to go and live her life. She is no longer uh, hindered by the issue of blood. It is in her past. She has been set free. And I want to say something to you as I close this morning. What you start with is not necessarily what you are stuck with. Did you hear me? What you start with 
is not what you are necessarily stuck with. Twelve years earlier, she started with this issue of blood. I promise you she wanted to give up. I promise you she had some dark days. I promise you she questioned God. But she, she didn't quit. She didn't quit because she knew that if she ever got in contact with Jesus, she wouldn't be stuck with this. Listen, what you start with is not necessarily what you are stuck with. What you need to do is reach out and touch the hem of his garment. You have to have the faith to believe that if Jesus sets you free, then you are free indeed in Jesus' name. There is no one like our God. Sing it out. There is no one like our God. Oh, there is no other God who can say. There is no one like our God. Who hung the stars upon the night and told the sun how bright to shine. Who shaped the world within his hands? Only You guys have a great afternoon. Get out there, enjoy the sunshine. I'll see you right here next week. Have a great one.